month. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, my name is Jao Ku from IPRI International Food Quality Research Institute. Uh, yeah, today we have uh, two visitors from this uh, development group, uh, this foundation. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, and also because last time we when we had this uh, minimum data set webinar, we had a lot of questions came in about this set, but we didn't have enough time to answer those questions. So uh, we thought today uh, it will be a great opportunity to have. Uh, Gary and Sherry here together and uh, go over some of the questions we had last time. Also get some new questions you might have before when we start to organize this webinar. So uh, in your Zoom window uh, at the bottom, you will find Q&A button. So if you have any new question you want to ask or, or if you already have some questions, uh, click on Q&A button and you can uh, enter your question and then we will go through those questions throughout Okay, uh, for me, and yeah, I will let Kai to also formally introduce our guest today. Hi. Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. I don't know who's attending, so I hope I can cover everything. My name is Kai Zonda. I work at the International Center for Maize and Wheat Improvement, uh, and I co lead the, the community of practice for crop modeling. Uh, which is part of the big data platform, as Joe just mentioned, and I'm happy to announce today or to introduce two very renowned people in the crop modeling world, Terit Hogenbaum and Cheryl Porter, both I think now from the University of Florida. When I started using this a bit and I took the course that these two people give every year in the University of Georgia at Griffin. I think Pellet was still with the University of Georgia. Now everybody's together in, in the University of Florida. As you might know, this hat suite has been around for a long, long time, has been used by many people. I don't know how many thousand people have gone through your uh, training. Pellet, maybe you have the figure somewhere next to it. And as we had a lot of questions that were not answered in the last session. Uh, they gracefully agreed to spend some more of their valuable time today with the community and with us and are ready for your questions. So um, I don't know if you briefly want to say what you're doing now and then we can get to the, to the question. I see there are already two questions there. Please go ahead. So um, hello everyone. Um, it's an honor again to, um, to talk to you today and I will First of all, I'd like to express my appreciation to the Roku and the platform for Big Data and Agriculture to give us opportunity to share what we're doing with uh, the DSAT system with you all. So what I've decided to do, give a little bit of a brief overview um, what DSAT is and where we're currently at and where we're planning to go before we answer any question. So many of you have already seen uh, this DSAT screen, uh, which is the, basically the magic to enter all the data and to run the models. And I just want to remind everyone that we're currently up to verse, DSAT version 4.75. If you don't have that version, it is freely available from our DSAT platform at uh, www.dsat.net. So we like to call DSAT, now actually give it a new name. We like to refer to it as the DSAT ecosystem. Because within DSAT software, um, we have a lot of utilities and tools, um, as well as data, to work with the crop models. And in fact, when you run DSAT, um, you will never see the crop model because it's all run in the background. But in order to, to run the model itself, um, we require input data. Um, and we provide you with various utilities and uh, support software to enter the data. And then also the applications are quite important as well. So we'll show you a little bit of that in a minute. I showed this slide in my last presentation as well, and sometimes we get questions really, um, how do we simulate all these processes? And what we actually have in DSAT is um, tens of thousands of equations which de deal with the biophysical processes of plant growth, development, soil water flow, uh, nitrogen processes, et cetera. But in summary, as you can see here, we basically deal with simulation of uh, plant development, trying to predict flowering, number of days to maturity, as well as plant growth, 
through photosynthesis, respiration, biomass partitioning, which ultimately gets us to yield. In order to run the crop simulation models, we require daily weather data as input, detailed uh, information with respect to these sort of physical and chemical properties of the soil. We need information about crop management. And last but not least, our information related to the genetics, especially um, the, the cultivar coefficients. And then ultimately, when we look at our simulations, it's not only about yield, but it is also about economics. And within the DSET uh, software, we have a few tools which can deal with the calculation of uh, gross margins and net income, looking at production costs, as well as um, income from the products that we harvest. We can look at environmental impacts, looking at nitrogen leaching, uh, the amount of water required for, uh, for irrigation, and ultimately looking at resource use as well. So when we look at, um, at the crop model itself, um, right here have a brief overview of how our current system is developed. So the, the actual crop model we refer to as the cropping system model or CSM. And this is basically one block of code to deal with the many different uh, plan genetics and modules we have within DSET. And this originally came from four different models, one for soybean called soy grow, one for peanuts called peanut grow, series wheat model and the series maize model. And over time we've made a lot of changes to the source code to make sure that right now we can really address what we call the agricultural system. And in order to simulate the agricultural system properly, we now use one set of computer code to deal with the uh, weather parameters, to deal with crop management, look at a soil plant atmosphere system to deal with soil, which is quite complex, looking not only at soil water, but also at soil nitrogen, and soil carbon dynamics, and also recently soil phosphorus. And then where we find the difference is what we call the plant modules, um, shown here where we have the crop grow module for the grain legumes, we have a series modules as well as a whole set of other modules dealing with different crops. So um, we get a lot of questions really, which crops can we simulate in this set? And we'll go quite quickly here. But again, I want to summarize what we currently have available uh, in this set as part of the, the grain regular models. We have the generic crop grow model, which can deal with soybean, peanuts, dry beans with fava bean, kuna fava bean with chickpea, with cow pea and pigeon pea. And we explain that in detail in our uh, workshops, but we actually don't have any computer code that tells us that if soybean do one equation and peanut do another equation, we work with external data files, which refers to genetic data files and species files, to deal with that. So that also allows us then to go beyond the grain legumes and use the same module for crop growth, looking at a simulation of cotton dynamics. And with respect to the, the cereals, of course, we have the, the series models, um, which actually are separate for wheat for rice, for sorghum, for maize, and for millet. And the barley and wheat model is the same model. Then in parallel to the maize model, series maize model, we have another model, um, which many people are not familiar with, it's called the action model. Uh, it was developed by John Lozazo, and it's more or less uh, based on the original series maize model. And then for wheat, we have a second model called Cropsim, developed by Tony Hunt, which can deal with wheat as well as with barley. And a recent addition uh, was the end wheat model developed by Central Design, which is now our third wheat model we have in the DSET system. And the most recent addition now is that we're trying to simulate TEF, the crop commonly grown in, in Africa, using the end wheat module as well. And for root crops, we have the, the substar model for potatoes, we have the original crop sim model, uh, which can deal with cassava. But the one we currently recommend is a new model that is being developed uh, in collaboration with CIOPS, as well as ITA called the UCA model. And then we have the AROT model for taro and tenure. And again, a recent addition is the series sugar beet model, which was developed about 15 years ago as a standalone model and recently was incorporated back into the DSAT system. Then also, the crop grow is being used for some recent uh, new crops, the sunflower model, the safflower model, as well as the canola model. The crop grow model is also being used for vegetables, uh, tomatoes, bell pepper, green bean and cabbage. And then for sweet corn, we use a version of the series maize model. 
And then finally, looking at sugar energy, we have two sugarcane models. One is the cane grow model, which was developed in collaboration with the South African Sugarcane Research Institute. Uh, Casu Pro, that was developed in collaboration with scientists from Colombia and Florida. And then recently we brought the uh, pineapple model, LOA, which was developed at the University of Hawaii, back into the DSAC system as well, uh, through funding provided by a private company. And then our most recent addition is a uh, perennial forage model, which was developed by Professor Budi at the University of Florida, again, based on the, the Corpro template, but it's quite different. And currently within DSET, we can uh, simulate off alpha. It's actually a nitrogen fixing a perennial crop, Bermuda grass and Brachiaria grass. And then the old crop growth template is still being used for the hay events. So with respect to DSET development, uh, there are quite a few activities currently occurring. Uh, first of all, again, I want to emphasize that the DSET software itself is a free software package. Uh, during the early days, we sold it for $400, but uh, since you made it freely available, we really have now uh, tens of thousands of users uh, would request the DSET software. And coming back to Kyle's question about people trained, it's probably also in the thousands, but we really have, you know, don't have an accurate number. One of the concerns people have expressed about the models itself is that they're all Fortran based. Um, many people are unable to um, use the Fortran languages. So in collaboration with Wellington Pavan um, in Brazil, we are now trying to implement what we call a mixed language programming system. We're moving forward and implementing the uh, ICASA standards, uh, trying to address still what we have what's called the Y2K uh, input and output issues. With respect to the output files, um, we now have a new feature available, so you can have actually a CSV output file. So we're working with Excel spreadsheets or R, a little bit easier um, to deal with those outputs. We're really um, also working hard to make our software open source. Uh, currently, the source code is available through GitHub, and we're really trying to encourage other people to collaborate with us to help improve uh, both the science in the model as well as to improve the tools associated with uh, preparing data as well as dealing with the output for applications. So as part of that, um, we know that some of our tools are quite old using old software packages like Visual Basics. So again, various groups are trying to develop new tools and, and new applications. Uh, along the same lines, currently DSAT is restricted to a Windows environment um, but we already have features that the models themselves can be run in Linux as well as on uh, Mac system for iOS. We also have in the past have had um, challenges on linkages between different types of models. Uh, there's a lot of interest with pests and diseases. So again, we're using um, docking technologies and wrappers. We're trying to link um, the various types of crop modeling systems together. So on your development, but it uh, has big progress with respect to the future, rather than having hard coding and uh, multi multiple models together, and after soft coding, things seem to operate much better. And then last but not least, we have now our uh, DSA development sprints. Um, they're organized once every six months, and these are like coding hackathons, and we, for people who are interested in coding, model improvement, uh, we encourage you to attend one of those sessions and try to work with us uh, to help improve DSA. So as I mentioned earlier, our source code is available uh, from GitHub. Uh, send us a request, I to show myself. Uh, we have currently issue with one piece of code with intellectual property um, rights, but we hope that in the near future we'll be able to make it fully open source using the C-Class BSD license um, for distribution. Um, with respect to some other improvements in the models themselves, I already mentioned that we now have the uh, perennial forage model in DSAP, so uh, there's a lot of interest uh, across the globe by adding multiple grass species to the model. Another one is the end wheat module uh, developed by uh, Cento de Seng. With respect to new crops, um, we're always trying to incorporate uh, new crops into DSAP, so the most recent one is, is the TAP model using the, the end wheat module. We have obtained new data for calibration of the model. Um, Dr. Budi, in collaboration with various visiting scientists, is working on guinea grass and rye grass. Another model we're looking at is a Caranella model based on the Canola model, the Guar model, and the Quinoa model, as well as the Chia model. 
Uh, there's also another uh, parallel effort that we're going to work with respect to model improvement. Again, it was developed by Central the Sandwich, we refer to as the, uh, the simple model. Um, simple models available as a standalone tool in R, but we're also working on implementing that in Fortran into our DSA system too. With respect to new processes we're trying to add to DSA, uh, we currently have a in-house version for salinity modules. So if you have any data related to salinity, we would love to work with you. We currently have a very robust plan P module in DSA. Quite a few, sorry, solve P model in this one, but quite a few crops currently uh, don't have an interaction with P. So, again, I uh, would like to work with the community to add those features to this app. And IBC working on a soil and plant uh, potassium model as well. We've had some issues with uh, dealing with uh, raised bed systems, especially with drip irrigation. So, for a Florida system, again, we have an in house version of what we call a two dimensional soil model. It seems to work fairly well. And then finally, we also have an in-house version that has been published where we've linked the Hydra's 1D model into the DSA plan map. We're also trying to add uh, greenhouse gas emissions components to DSA. And in the latest version, we have the NOx emissions uh, available. And again, if you have any data, we'd love to collaborate with your groups to help improve um, the underlying science of those modules and compare Simulate the data with what they're available. And what I mentioned in the earlier slide, again, we were trying to work on improvement of the pest and disease coupling as well. So, this is my final slide. Um, we're planning the next DSA development sprint at the University of Florida, and anyone who's really interested in working on coding, you're welcome to join us from January 6th through January 10th, 2020, at the University of Florida. And again, this is another training workshop. This is a workshop where uh, people have to work during the workshop. So we'd be glad to answer any questions uh, you may have. Should we start at the top or is yeah, there another? Uh, yeah, let's start from the top. Okay. So the first question, actually not on your screen, but on our screen, uh, is from uh, Halavi Singh. So he has three years of study field experimental data. Uh, one of those years has been skewed. Ah, so yeah, it has been part of the strategy. Okay. And yeah, so um, this is a question we often get. So how much data is required for model calibration and model evaluation? Um, I think your question is very appropriate because you have three years of data. So I recommend that you probably use at least two years of your data for model calibration rather than using one year of data. Um, make sure to use your best data set for model calibration. And make sure that your second data set has a somewhat different environment compared to your fir first data set and then use the third one for, for model evaluation. If you only use one year of data for model calibration, it's highly likely that your genetic coefficients are not going to be very robust. Anything to add? No. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Good. Then, uh, the second question um, is who the developers of this? So who are the developers of this? Set? So you're looking at them. <laughs> two of them. There's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them. But you're looking at the two key developers who spend most of the time on in development of this. Set. So the original this set, uh, the idea came from uh, Professor Jim Jones, a colleague of us at the University of Florida, who's now uh, retired and really is not involved in any hands-on coding of uh, DSET. Mm -hmm. The DSET itself is, is uh, part of a, a team of people, a community uh, working on code improvement. But we have a fairly large group at the University of Florida who works on uh, improvement of DSET. And in fact, uh, Dr. Yuri Ku, who's sitting here, is also involved in improvement. We have colleagues at uh, CGR Systems who are collaborating with those who use the ARS, uh, people in Brazil, so it's a very large community, but uh, the key people who are currently responsible for DSAT, uh, they're looking at it on the screen. <laughs> but at the same time, we're also model users. Right, so yeah. And, and Garrett mentioned previously about the development sprints that we do twice a year, which are open to anybody who has an interest in developing some component related to DSAT. So contact us if you're uh, willing to work on some bits of code to improve the model or add a new capability. 
yeah. and we don't charge for your participation in the visa development program either. You just have to pay your own travel expenses. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next question is: Is there a manual to build this set model? So it's not just using it, but how to build the model. So um, yeah. I'm assuming this question has to do yeah. with how to compile the source code and build oh, the executable yeah. for your particular operating system, and. Um, we keep all of the source code on a GitHub repository, and there are instructions for how to build the code. Um, in the past few years, we've worked on making that a lot easier um, for cross-compatibility of different operating systems. Um, and so we use CMake, which is a, a third-party utility that allows you to build your project. I mean, it actually builds a Visual Studio project for you. And, um, it's a pretty nice utility and it does make it a lot easier than it used to be. So if you're interested, um, we can give you access to that GitHub repository. Oh, by the way, all the resources we are, we are going to mention today, uh, yeah, I will type them uh, in the meeting note and share with everyone. So yeah, if you didn't get a uh, CMake, then yeah, I will share where to find that uh, after the webinar. The next one, uh, so what data resources do we have to develop applications in emerging markets like Africa? So it's another way is to find those data for new countries and new regions. So it's asking what data we have. Um, I mean, what we really recommend is when you want to use DSA that you provide your own data. Um, data. So we, in DSA, we have some, some data sources that are quite minimal. Uh, we mainly provide you with experimental data associated with the, the various crop models um, we have in DSAT. But if you're looking for, for applications uh, across the globe, uh, we provide recommendations for, for data sources. And we know, for instance, that weather data is always very challenging. So on our website, uh, we have a link to what we call the NASA Power Data Set, which is a grid of daily weather data set that I have to agree you can use uh, as one resource, but again, you need to understand the limitations of those data sources. Um, yeah, well, cool. uh, recently published a grid of um, soil database, which we've used as well as input for um, uh, DSAT, uh, say in, in Africa. Um, one of the challenges is going to be running it at a larger scale is finding local crop, in, crop management information. And again, we've used uh, a spatial database also provided by if called span as one of the generic inputs. Uh, the biggest challenge is going to be uh, obtaining local genetics, which you really, as a, as a DSET community, were, uh, or DSET developers were unable to provide, but as a DSET community, we could try to develop um, something we could share, like on our DSET platform. And people have developed uh, what we call our cultivar coefficient for particular crop particular country uh, once you've published it uh, in a paper and then you should be able to share that on the website as well. Okay, uh, so relatedly, uh, the next question, okay, okay, so from the same person, uh, is what are the minimum parameters to calibrate the model? Yeah, he, he asked about specifically seed model, but I think it could be um, pretty cool. Fact, uh, the minimum data respect to model calibration, we did a seminar on that uh, about two months ago, so I, I recommend that you go look at that webinar. Yeah. That, that, that's what this webinar originally. Right. Um, and the next question is about adding new crop. I think this is also quite a commonly frequently asked question. So he's interested in red pepper, uh, quinoa, uh, that are not in this set model. Uh, but he has some experimental research, so how, how does he need to go about it? Um, yeah, we get those questions uh, quite often. Uh, in order to add a new crop, um, we, we normally like to use one of our existing what we call crop modules in DSAT to develop it. And as you saw in my presentation, that the crop code template is commonly being used. So, but in order then to define the crop code template for a new crop, we need to have some basic physiological information that defines the response of the crop to temperature, to soil radiation. We need to know a little bit about the composition of the crop, for leaves, for, for grains, for stems, and for roots. All that information uh, is put into a data file. And that can be obtained from the literature to get started, but then ultimately we still need some experimental data for the uh, first calibration of this new model. Is there official document or guideline you can point to? Like, 
like how to add new crop in the uh, there's no official uh, document or guideline but if you go into the literature there are quite a few papers mm -hmm. that describe that people have added uh, a new mm -hmm. crop to these zones uh, the one most recent one was a paper on the uh, Balfour model mm -hmm. it was published uh, i think about a year ago uh, by a visiting scientist from spain uh, there's a paper on the canola model which was published maybe about five years ago so there's, there's some uh, papers in literature that describe mm -hmm. that people uh, added new crops to these zones. Okay. Okay. Uh, Nathan, now how can I compute irrigation requirement using this set? Okay. Um, so this set, probably the easiest way to do that is this set has a feature called automatic irrigation, and you can set that automatic irrigation to run over um, a number of years. We call that a seasonal analysis where you're running over um, um, a variety of, of weather years that show the variability in, in weather over time. And you can optimize the amount of irrigation using this automatic irrigation feature. So the way automatic irrigation works is you set parameters for um, management depth of the soil, um, what, how dry does the soil need to be to trigger an irrigation event, and how far do you want to fill the soil profile in an irrigation event. Um, and so you can use that to see what the irrigation requirements would be over a number of years. Um, that, that's one way to do it. We, we also have some new irrigation features in the model um, that allow you to control irrigation based on growth stage, um, based on how frequently you want to irrigate. For example, if you have a center pivot, you may want to limit irrigation to once per five days or something like that. Um, and it also allows you to set the maximum um, amount of water that's available for irrigation. So there's a lot of uh, new features that are in DSAT that allow you to do some interesting things with irrigation. Great. Thank you. That's a nice segue to the next question. What are the new features or development of the latest version of this set? But also, Gary, you mentioned a long list of uh, new features mm -hmm. coming in the new uh, latest version. So what, what is the timeline for latest version or the next best version of this set release? I think that's what people are quite waiting for. Um, we're always very optimistic. Um, I expect that we hope to have a new release available by our uh, upcoming training workshop at the University of Georgia in 2020. Mm -hmm. In many cases, we uh, try to evaluate a new version during the workshop to see if there are any uh, issues and bugs. And then once we're comfortable with the software, we will be able to release it. Right. So our next, uh, probably, hopefully, next summer, we, we should have a new version available. We're really working very hard to uh, to deal with what we call a Y2K issue. And we have something uh, we're developing in collaboration with uh, Professor Wellington Papal, the one called Flexible IO. And we hope to have part of it implemented uh, in the next version, uh, especially for, for weather data, because we currently realize that there are quite a few limitations on the, on the input of the weather. I, I want to add to that. So. Um, when we release a particular new feature it depends on um, how much data we have for testing it, how long it takes to develop it. Some, some features may take years to um, finalize and actually make available for our users. Um, a lot of times we'll release a feature and not really advertise it. So users that are really interested in it and have data and can test it for us can use it, but we don't really advertise that it's available. So there's various levels of release of new features. Yeah, in, in fact, the next question is also quite relevant. Uh, the next question is about the uh, DNDC-like uh, soil gas emission modeling. Uh, and then uh, Gary also mentioned that it's, it's coming or yeah. it's, it's, it's being yeah, added. Yeah, the NOX one, uh, Charles working on the methane emissions as well. So right. We're doing that in collaboration with IMDC. Right, right. So, and ammonia volatilization has been there all along, so, or for at least as long as I've been working with DSET. Right. So, yeah, so the N2O emissions is already in the model. It's in the latest release. Um, we, I, I have to admit, we don't have a lot of experience with it. And so we're, 
we're anxious to work with people who have real data to help us evaluate it and see how the model's doing. So um, if you do have uh, N2O emission data, we'd, we'd be happy to hear from you and work with you on that. Okay, great. Um, the next question is on solar radiation, uh, solar radiation, sorry, uh, daily solar radiation. What type of daily solar radiation data should be used? Yes, um, there's only one, uh, <laughs> one type of solar radiation data we like to use, which is uh, solar energy. We use it. We're looking at uh, megajoules per meter square per, per day, but um, we know that in, that information in some cases is not available. So if you have sunshine hours, you can use our weatherman tool to convert sunshine hours to daily total solar radiation. If you don't have solar radiation data from your location, um, then you can possibly use the NASA power as an alternate. And we've also have had developed tools um, that generate solar radiation based on maximum and minimum temperature and precipitation as input and clear sky, local clear sky radiation. I would not recommend uh, that you use that, that option. Uh, especially for model calibration and validation. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and, and I will include a link or uh, more information about weatherman um, yeah, in, the, in the meeting notes later. Okay, good. Our next question is about uh, how to simulate or model's ability to simulate crop response to full organic matter in West Africa specifically. And, and the person is asking whether he need to access source, source code to modify anything. Um, but I, I don't think that's the case. You can use... Yeah, no, no, yeah. I mean, you should not have to modify the source code for any type of application. In fact, uh, especially recently during uh, collaboration with scientists in West Africa, South Africa, and East Africa, as part of the ACNIP project, We've done extensive uh, testing of, uh, of the DSAT models on the low input systems. So with respect to soil organic matter, we actually have two options, uh, which I forgot to mention. One is the, uh, what we refer to as the old and traditional method developed by Doug Gutwin, and that was based on a model from him and from Kermit from the Netherlands. But we also have the daily sentry model included in DSAT as well. So for low input systems, so organic matter is important, we recommend that you use the sentry model. But if you use the sentry model, it's very important that you define your, uh, your soil organic carbon pools properly. We realize that those are difficult to measure. So again, we have various mechanisms that you can find these. And, uh, the most generic one is just to uh, look at field history, which you can do for the uh, field section in this set. If you have a little bit more information related to so uh, stable soil organic carbon, you can do that in the soil analysis section to make sure that you define and initialize the soil organic carbon properly uh, for those systems. And again, you, uh, you can change that option uh, in simulation controls. Right. So, yes. Uh, so, to Nathaniel, yes, it's possible and you don't need to have source code access. And yeah, you can, uh, yeah, you can use sentry model uh, to achieve the soil organic matter response to those crops in West Africa. Um, one more thing, yeah. we do have a user's guide for initializing soil oh. carbon that I can right. make available. Uh, yes, yes, that, that's what a great resource. Um, and relatedly, um, yeah, another question is uh, whether DSEC can capture the interaction between crops, soil, climate. And yes, that's, that's, yeah. that's how it was <laughs> developed. It's, it's, um, yeah. It looks at the biophysical processes. So, uh, the models do a very good job with it in dealing with the interaction between the soil, the atmosphere, and the planet. Yes. So, answer it yes, uh, definitely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> An emphatic yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, um, are you planning to develop a code for water exchange between groundwater and rootstone? So, like a shallow groundwater table? Um, yeah, that's that's one thing that we don't handle very well right now in DSAT, but we mm -hmm. do, as part of this 2D model that Garrett mentioned, we actually do have a better um, interaction between the saturated zone and the unsaturated zone and the water moving up through that, that column. Um, we really should introduce that into the 1D model. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that yet, mm -hmm. but that, that is something that we're 
you know, we, we have in the works. Mm -hmm. And also, um, there has been some activities by a group uh, of North Carolina State University that has developed a, a model called Drain Map mm -hmm. to link uh, the crop component into these are crop models into drain mud, and we also, we've had discussions to turn it around and take a, a drain mud code and bring it into DSET. Uh, we haven't made much progress on those activities. Okay. So, yeah, it's coming. So, mm -hmm. the next one, next question is about uh, plenty fees, uh, especially for crop, uh, cotton. So, uh, Ramdeo is asking, how can I include disease data for target spot? specific to cotton. And yeah, so there are two year analysis on leaf defoliation data and target spot occurrence and the disease occurrence data. And and yeah, so how that can how those data can be included in this set. Um, so in the current version of this set uh, we the, the pest and disease interaction is static. So we have to enter the, uh, the plan damage through our, what we call our T file, which is our observed data file. And then we have a set of uh, coupling points, which was originally developed by Professor Woody, again at the University of Florida, which defines how a pest or disease interacts with the crop. We don't have that yet for cotton, but we have it for various other uh, crops in this set, so we can use the other crops as a, again, as an example to see how we can implement that uh, for cotton. But uh, we encourage you to, to contact us and to work yeah. with us, <laughs> but there's no manual on, on how to do that. Okay, so yeah, please contact Gary about that, uh, that question. Um, and TEF mother, uh, Gary, you mentioned TEF mother, so the person, think, uh, no, this is really exciting new feature. So yeah, it's asking, uh, is it already available in current DSET version? Or if so how to use it? <laughs> it? It's not been released yet. Yeah. Um, in fact, it, um, the author of that, Kirsten Poff, has not published it yet. So oh. we're hesitant to release it. Although, um, if there's interest and if you have data, we are willing to work with you to improve that model. It's, it's at this point, had limited um, testing because there's limited data. Mm. So um, it's yes and no. It's not available in the current version, but if you're very interested, contact us. In fact, there'll be a lot of interest. I saw some presentations modifying Millet model for TEF and modifying WIT model for TEF. Mm. I think there are a lot of creative solutions out yeah. there already. Mm. So I think this will be very exciting. Mm. Uh, next question. Ah, uh, great question. Can I use this for intercropping? The short answer is no. <laughs> um, yeah, the long answer. Well, so um, intercropping obviously requires that you be able to grow two plants in the same field at the same time. And at the current time, we can only grow one plant in a field at a time. So we have done some testing with a very simple, um, simple model that's structured the same way as DSET. And we proof of concept, we can do it. But we just we have not um, had the resources to implement that in the full model yet. We do have plans to do that. Yeah, we've, we've had <laughs> plans for twenty five years to be. Honest. And then <laughs> no. the, the the biggest uh, issue right now is resources to do it. So mm. uh, really, any any development which requires major coding um, requires some financial resources to pay for for some of our time to do the work because everything is done on what we call soft money. And also we'll need some good data as well. So uh, it's easy to ask for intercropping, but then uh, we need to know how the two crops compete for nutrients, how the two cro crops compete for, for water, and how to compete for life, and that's much more challenging. Yeah, um, the next question is about, uh, yeah, again, a crop disease simulation. Uh, in this uh, ecosystem. And I think we, we touched that a little bit, but uh, so how can I simulate the impact of specific pest or disease in this uh, ecosystem? I think Gary already mentioned maybe the best will be. Yeah, I mean, the best way is currently working yeah. through FALT, but also again yeah. uh, with our group uh, in Brazil with uh, Dr. Wellington for Bayern, uh, we have some in house versions where we can more do, use more dynamic pest and disease simulation through some of the generic pest modules he has developed. 
So if you're really interested in that, uh, again, contact us. And especially if you have data, then we can evaluate uh, these mm -hmm. new features properly. Right. <laughs> and the next question is on training. Uh, so any plan for training in East Africa, for example? Um, there's, um, I'll be in South Africa in less than a month to do a training there. So um, I think it's a short flight from East <laughs> Africa to South Africa. So I encourage you to participate in the workshop in South Africa. Okay. Um, and yeah, I also wanted to add, uh, keep following the feed and uh, the news event on DZ website. I think there are a lot of training mm -hmm. uh, programs are being announced. So yeah, if there will be one not currently in East Africa yet, but on yeah. the South Africa. Um, yeah, and again, to add to it, um, yeah. normally when people ask for a workshop, um, beyond the one we do at University of Georgia, which is our standard workshop, that's the one we organize. But right. If you're interested in, in sponsoring a workshop, um, then feel free to contact us and we'll be glad to work with you. Uh, it will require some financial resources. We as the set foundation and really have not any money to support the training. So um, we then request that uh, if you want to host a workshop, that you pay for our travel expenses, pay for, for local expenses, and also uh, need to uh, provide a contribution to the foundation for the resource material to use in the workshop. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, we will be glad to work with you uh, on the workshop in East Africa. Okay, great. Um, and Mejan is asking uh, the DSAT output currently doesn't include carbon-related results and carbohydrate accumulation, growth photosynthesis, um, et cetera. But is that? Yeah, yeah. so um, the, the carbon outputs depend on which crop model you're using, but typically they're switched on with a switch in simulation controls, which is mm. just um, one of the output switches for carbon. So that would be the first thing to check. Is that set to yes? And um, if it's set to no, you're not going to be getting those carbon outputs. Um, and some models are much more complex than others. The crop grow has a lot of carbon type output series. Not so much. Not so much. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure which crop you're working right. with, but um, I think and Garrett, you can correct me, but I think all of the crop models do have some sort of yeah. carbon yeah. output. So you, you should be able to switch that on. Mm, okay. So yeah, that's the first thing to check. Um, Solomon is asking in the, sol uh, yeah, she's working on sorghum. And he has two years of data, but he doesn't have weather data. And how to go about, go about and how to do calibration in such case. You don't have no weather data, man. That's um, that's very unfortunate. <laughs> um, I would first check with um, your local med office to see if they're willing to provide you with the data. We realize that some of the local med offices are not very very cooperative to provide you with the data. Um, but the alternative would be again as a power. But as I said earlier, this is weather data at a very high I mean, spatial resolution is one half a degree. So especially for rainfall, if you uh, experiment what's conducted during the rainy season, and that information is not going to be very reliable. So I would be very careful. So I first would see if you can obtain your data from the local med office. Mm -hmm. The weather station is maybe 50 kilometers away from, from your site. And I would really encourage you for any experiment you conduct to at least install a rain gauge to get your local rainfall data. And the next question is, does this take into account the quality of water, like salinity of water? Um, so the, the soil water component of DSET does track um, nitrogen species, um, and to a certain extent, phosphorus. Salinity is a new module that has just been added. It has not yet been released, and again, it, um, it could use more data sets for testing. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. We do track nitrogen leaching and movement in the soil column. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
this. And I think next question, I think this is for you, sir. Uh, so what kind of input format <laughs> does this set take? Is it CSV or? Um, uh, okay, so yeah. DSET has very specific fixed format ASCII, basically text files. Okay, so you can open the files and look at them and read them, but they're in very specific formats that have um, headers that mean something to DSET, but they won't mean something to humans. So what we have is a lot of applications that help you um, prepare your input files. So for weather data, we have Weatherman. For um, experimental data, we have XBuild. For soil data, we have SBuild. Um, for your observed experimental data, we have AT Create. So there's all these different applications that Garrett showed in that diagram of the DSET ecosystem that allow you to prepare your data, um, run the model, and then interpret your outputs. Um, we did mention we, some of the outputs are now available in CSV format to help mm -hmm. you um, analyze the outputs in, with modern tools. But not the input. But not the input. input. Not yet. Yeah. And, and, I, and that's the other thing I should mention yeah. is that we're um, working on a flexible I.O. system that will allow different kinds of input data to be used. Okay. That's not available yet. But uh, we think within the next year, we should have okay. um, a lot of that in place. Okay, great. Well, uh, next question. Uh, yeah, so it's one of the also commonly asked, uh, discussed question. How do you think of other models like AquaCraft, FSIM, CraftSyst, compared with DSET? Uh, we think that DSET is the best model for this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a bad question. So. Um, yeah. No, but I mean, all models have the strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we know that there are multiple crop models out there. Um, and so I think that leave, we leave it up to the user to decide which, uh, which model you really want to work with and which model you want to be more comfortable with. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. And maybe this is also a good point to mention Agami project. Um, yeah, so within the agriculture modeling comparison and improvement, uh, Project. In fact, there were, there were two activities uh, I mentioned earlier. We had case studies in East Africa, South Africa, and West Africa, as well as in South Asia, where we looked at climate change impact studies, um, taking outputs of GCMs as inputs into multiple crop models, not only DSEP, but also working uh, with EPSIM, and then took that into an economic model called TIER and D to ultimately come up with uh, policy recommendations uh, for, for local governments. So there's one activity back then. The second one is the uh, comparison of uh, various crop models. So especially for the mo major commodities, uh, some very strong groups currently are working in various phases where many different models are being compared. So one is wheat. I think we're currently in the current phase are at least 40 or 50 different models. Uh, being compared as a, a rice activity, it's just a new soybean activity has, has been started. So um, as part of those activities, uh, common data sets are provided to all modelers, and then they just uh, compare how well the model, individual models uh, form with respect to prediction of uh, phenology and, and yield. And then the ultimate goal is really to even look at the science or how these various models predict those processes to improve the crop models. Okay. Um, yeah, and I also include a link to the ACME project and some of the papers uh, also mentioned, uh, Gary mentioned in the response. And if I can put a little plug, um, I think the next ACME conference is scheduled for 2020 in Nanjing in October. Oh, okay. Great. Um, and the next question about using crop model in new environment, again, uh, so uh, asking whether uh, how to go about using potato model in Canada. Uh, does that require Can Canadian environmental data to calibrate? Or does, does a crop model need to be, a source code need to be modified? And how to, to go about it? Um, so the underlying idea of the, of the crop models is that um, they're independent of location. So we hope that we do a fairly good job in assimilating the physiological processes, the soil process, the soil plant atmosphere interactions, 
So you should be able to take a model that was developed say in Florida or somewhere else in the US and then run it for a different location as long as you get input data available. What you do need is local genetics because we know that the potatoes that are being grown in Florida are different from the potatoes that are being grown in Canada. So we highly recommend that before you use the model for a new location that you at least come up with the local genetics do some local calibration, do some local evaluation. And then you should be able to expand your application to, to other locations in that, in that region. Okay, great. Um, the next question, uh, does this set include a spatial aspect like land use assessment, for example? Um, that, or, or does it simulate in just particular field? Um, so all the crop models we so far have mentioned, they're all point-based models. So we need uh, weather data from a point, from a weather station, a profile that's a point, as well as crop management. Um, but we have worked extensively, including uh, Yeru here as well, in what we call the spatial applications of the crop models. So they have been used for precision uh, management within the field. So if you have a one meter spatial resolution input data available for wet and soil and crop management, we can predict uh, spatial yield variability within the field. And we can scale it up to, uh, to larger regions and even up to the globe. So the currently uh, global gridded models, global gridded crop models that run at a half a degree grid or even higher spatial resolution to look at uh, crop production across the globe. So it's all possible. You just need to understand the limitation of the models. And especially in this case, if you scale up to larger regions, the limitations of the input data. Okay, um, so the next question is about sensitivity analysis tool. Uh, whether sensitivity analysis tool for one crop model like NWIT can be used instead of series wheat model. And but the sensitivity, the new sensitivity analysis tool in DSA is uh, is model independent, yeah. but it's still but it's still under development. So uh, so it you might use it for NWIT. Um, I think you have. I, here's what I think and. I would have to try it myself, which I'm not going to do right now. I think you have to go into DSAT Pro or, or change the configuration of your default model mm. first and tell it that when you run wheat, you want to run in wheat, and then it's going to mm. default to end wheat. Okay. So if you're interested in uh, an intermodal comparison between DSAT, that's possible too. So if you want to compare series wheat, uh, right. crops in wheat, and end wheat, um, you cannot do that for sensitivity analysis to it. But you have to go back to uh, to your crop management file and clearly define there which which crop model you're going to use. And actually, we have to do that for simulation controls, uh, which could be a little bit challenging to define. And when you do that, you need to make sure that you have the cultivar genetics available for all three crops as well. The different default model change. You can do it on the interface too, right? Uh, you as you're running the model through the DSAT interface, you can change which crop model you're right. using. But in the sensitivity uh, tool, okay. it does not have oh, that okay. ability. Okay, uh, I, I will include that information in the uh, meeting yeah. notes, so maybe it may not be too easy to find. Okay, good. Um, the next one, so just getting started with DSAT and having some issues getting gridded root mass data and surface residue data and visual nitrogen data, I think, yeah, so, Maybe it's uh, getting issues, getting all these input data. But are, are those critical input data? Gridded root mass. So I'm assuming that you're running over um, a gridded land surface. Mm -hmm. Is that, I'm, I think okay. that's, yeah. that's what yeah. that means. So you're actually starting out as a power user. <laughs> 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 right? we, yeah. we recommend learning the basics first. Um, but any coming up with the initial conditions for uh, modeling over um, any kind of gridded system is always a challenge. You're not going to necessarily have measured data, so you're you're probably going to have to make assumptions about what that root root mass is and what the surface residue is and um, what the initial nitrogen conditions are. 
um, and adjust it as you go. I, I don't know whether you want to add to oh, that. Yeah, no. We we also face the same issue as well. So in many cases, we we call this guesstimate. We we use best local knowledge to estimate what is input parameter should be. Mm -hmm. In yeah. some cases, just running a sim simple sensitivity analysis might help too. Right, right. If, if you're running the models on a grid, then you're power user. You're not a beginner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so we had just a few minutes left. So uh, yeah. Both a few few questions answered. So if you have any last question to ask, um, you can do so. But we may not have enough time. Uh, then yeah, we, we will follow up in the meeting notes later. Uh, just quickly, uh, lace sewn maize. So in the particular region that uh, the person is asking, it's not very well calibrated, and yeah, uh, possibly because of the interaction between crop and ambient conditions. So yeah, for better calibration, do you need to modify source code? Or I think not? you just need better data. Right, yeah, better data. Right. Yeah, no, or we can turn it around. So if you if you have, if you feel that your data are perfect, mm -hmm. you have multiple environments, so multiple years and multiple locations, and the model is unable to be calibrated, then then maybe there's a flaw in the model, which we know the model is definitely right, not perfect. Right, right, right. But then we highly recommend that you work with us model developers to see what we can do to improve the code. Uh, and, and one thing which uh, sometimes people make changes to the code without talking to us uh, to, uh, for the local condition, but then it turns out that if we implement those code changes for other location, uh, the model will break. So it is any code changes we make uh, with respect to improvement of the science, we want to make sure that we still get the same answer for other locations where we really have experimental data and data data. Right. Okay, great. Um, for the crop forecast, like youth forecast, uh, what would you say about accuracy level? <laughs> um, yield forecast. Um, the models are perfect. The problem, <laughs> the problem is the input data. Um, so you need to have access to, again, very good weather data, uh, which means you have to update your weather data on a daily basis up to yesterday. You need to have access to very, very good uh, weather forecast data. You can use the WARF model, which we don't distribute. It's another source for at least uh, 10 days out. But beyond that, it's going to become climatology, and that's what the challenge is. So uh, we're looking at spatial yield forecasting for a region, and again, you need to have proper soil input data available, and you have crop and crop management data available as well. So, mm -hmm. we, in fact, we just released uh, a new tool called Craft, uh, which was specifically designed for spatial yield uh, forecasting, and this was developed in collaboration with the Seacraft uh, program, also mm -hmm. part of CGI. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, we have a few more questions still entered, but yeah, unfortunately, we don't have time. And actually, uh, uh, Garrett and Sherry are busy today for other meetings to move to. So uh, we are going to wrap up. Uh, so Kai, would you like to uh, say a few words before we close the webinar today? Yes. So many, many thanks to the two presenters, Sherry and Garrett. Many thanks for taking your valuable time to answer all these questions. As you can see, there are still more. I think we could do it again in the near future, maybe also uh, refer to some of the other bigger models to cover all the ground. Um, as Gerrit was mentioning, there's a lot of new data coming online. Um, here at CIMIT, we do a lot of foresight work with the models, mainly with DSAT, and um, there's a lot of new climate data sets. Some of the questions were directed at, to that also that are coming up, both from the private sector and the public sector. Uh, We've been using obviously also NASA power for a long time for all those sites where we didn't have proper access, where med services were not covering or not available. Um, the EU with their Copernicus weather store, they are putting up uh, even sub daily weather data 30 years back. Um, we are getting alternatives from companies like IBM, the weather company, Aware, and other sources are coming up, Meteor Blue. And um, so our biometricians here are quite excited at the moment because we can redo a lot of G by E analysis, also crop modeling that was previously done, maybe based on uh, low resolution daily data or monthly data even. And with advances in remote sensing and many other sensors, uh, both handcast and forecast, I think is looking a lot better. 
obviously validation and those things are very important, but um, it's a big group. So I would like to thank again, Jawu, Ifpri, Siad, all the people involved, Annabelle on our side who organized this. Present this again, all the participants. Thank you for your questions, your interest. Uh, we will make this available, I think, online on the big data platform so that people can go back to it. Maybe send follow-up questions to some of the uh, some of the people involved. And uh, there's a lot of information, obviously, on the web pages of ICASA uh, and other relevant places where you can find GitHub was mentioned, where you can find manuals, data, uh, the newest version of the of the models, and a lot of other people. So, thanks a lot to all involved, and uh, let's close this then. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your interest. Okay. Thanks. Bye.